Welcome to Unit 10, Video 2, Phase Changes. By the end of this video, you should understand how intermolecular forces relate to phase changes. You should understand the concept of dynamic equilibrium and how it applies to boiling and vapor pressure. You should understand what vapor pressure is and how it relates to the normal boiling point. And you should understand what is meant by the term normal boiling point. Let's start with a quick refresher about changes of state or phase changes. You might recall that phase changes are the conversion of a substance from one physical state to another, and they involve a change in energy. For instance, if we want to melt a solid and convert it into a liquid, we need to add energy. Likewise, if we want to vaporize a liquid into a gas, we have to add energy. These are endothermic processes because energy is entering the system. On the other hand, if you want to condense a gas into a liquid, energy must exit the system. Or if you want to freeze a, a liquid into a solid, again, energy must exit the system. These are exothermic processes, exo for exit. Looking at a simulation of this process, we see here we have water molecules in the solid phase. In order to get them into the liquid phase, we have to add energy. Notice this causes the molecules to move around more and move further away. Eventually, we'll add enough energy to get them to move very far apart into the gas phase. As we, heated up the, as we heated up the solid water to liquid and then to gas, the intermolecular forces, particularly the hydrogen bonds holding one water molecule to another, were being overcome. If I cool down the gas and allow it to recondense into a liquid and then re-solidify into a solid, you'll see that the hydrogen bonds reform. The water molecules once again become attracted to one another. They slow down and the molecules begin to bunch together. Again, to overcome the intermolecular forces between the molecules, we have to add energy. To reform the intermolecular forces between the molecules, we need to take energy away. So in summary, for an endothermic phase change to occur, molecules must move further apart. Therefore, intermolecular forces must be overcome. In this video, we're going to focus specifically on vaporization, the inner conversion between liquid and gas. This is the change that occurs when particles gain enough energy to escape the liquid phase and enter the gas phase. It's also known as evaporation, and it's an endothermic process because energy must be put in. On the flip side, condensation is the opposite of vaporization. This is the conversion from gas to liquid. Energy must be released here as it's an exothermic process. So when do these things happen? Well, evaporation happens when the molecules in the substance have enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces holding the molecules together in the liquid phase. Condensation, on the other hand, occurs when vapor particles collide with the liquid and are trapped by the intermolecular forces of the molecules at the top of the liquid sample. Here's an animation of that process. Notice the molecules on top represent water molecules in the gas phase, the molecules on the bottom, water molecules in the liquid phase. Notice that occasionally a water molecule from the liquid phase will gain enough energy to overcome the forces of attraction holding it in the liquid phase and it'll become a gas. When that happens, the simulation makes the molecule turn blue so you can see it. On the other hand, occasionally a water molecule from the vapor phase will come close enough to the liquid phase to get trapped by the forces of attraction of the molecules in the liquid phase. Those molecules are turned yellow in the simulation. You might also notice, if you watch this simulation for a while, that the number of molecules in the gas phase and the number of molecules in the liquid phase are relatively constant. In other words, every time a molecule leaves the liquid phase to enter the gas phase, another molecule from the gas phase enters the liquid phase. This is called equilibrium. In other words, the rate at which uh, liquid molecules are becoming gaseous molecules is equal to the rate at which gaseous molecules are becoming liquid molecules. So to define the term dynamic equilibrium, we can say that this occurs when the rate of a forward process is equal to the rate of a reverse process. It's dynamic because both processes are still occurring, but it's at equilibrium because there's no overall net change. 
A good analogy is the population. If the birth rate equals the death rate, we can say that the population is in dynamic equilibrium. For every person that dies, someone is born. Therefore, we'll never have a change in total number of people, but those people won't always be the same. The process is dynamic because people are still dying and people are still being born, but there's no overall change to the population. For the, our purposes here, we're going to be looking at liquid vapor equilibrium. This occurs when the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. In other words, the amount of liquid and vapor will be constant. There will be no net change, even though some liquid is still becoming vapor and some vapor is still becoming liquid. Let's return to the animation and watch this process in action. Notice here we have a sample of liquid water. There's no vapor yet. I'm going to assume that we put a lid on this system so the vapor can escape. And I'm going to start the simulation. Notice that right away, some liquid starts to evaporate. The liquid level goes down, and some molecules enter the vapor phase. Once some molecules have entered the vapor phase, some will recondense into the liquid phase. Eventually, like now, we'll have reached equilibrium, where the rate of molecules leaving the liquid to become a gas is equal to the rate at which gas molecules enter the liquid phase to become a liquid. Looking at this in a static picture, you'll see that the first picture represents when we first put the molecules in a closed container. Only evaporation is occurring because there's no vapor to condense yet. In the second container, once enough vapor has formed, some of it will start to recondense as represented by the blue arrows. And finally, once equilibrium is reached, the rate at which molecules are leaving the liquid phase is equal to the rate at which molecules are entering, uh, entering the liquid phase. Graphically, we see that the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation eventually become equal to one another. Here, the dotted line represents the point at which equilibrium was established, the rate at which condensation equals the rate of evaporation. Notice that condensation starts off with a, a very steep change in rate because some uh, vapor needs to form in order for evaporation to start kicking in. It's also important to note that these processes will only reach equilibrium if the container is closed, so no vapor can escape. With this idea in mind, we can define something called the equilibrium vapor pressure. This is the pressure of the water vapor at equilibrium. It's also just called vapor pressure. In other words, if we measure the pressure of the vapor phase of the substance when it's at equilibrium, we have our vapor pressure. Liquids with a high vapor pressure are said to be highly volatile. They evaporate easily. This should make sense. Something that evaporates easily will have a lot of molecules in the gas phase once equilibrium is established. Because they're very volatile, they must have weak intermolecular forces, meaning that it's easy for the molecules to separate from one another. It doesn't take a whole lot of energy to overcome the intermolecular forces to get them to evaporate. On the other hand, molecules like water with strong intermolecular forces will have very low volatility. The molecules are being held together very strongly by their intermolecular forces, so they evaporate at a very slow rate and not much vapor. They have very low vapor pressures. Vapor pressure increases significantly with temperature, which should make sense. As you increase the temperature of a substance, more and more of it will evaporate increasing the number of particles in the gas phase and therefore increasing the vapor pressure. Here's a graph of vapor pressure versus temperature. Notice that in every case, as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases. Which one of these substances do you think has the weakest intermolecular forces? You should have said chloroform. Notice that at every temperature, chloroform has the highest vapor pressure, making it the most volatile. Therefore, it has the weakest intermolecular forces holding it together. This brings us around to the idea of boiling point once again. In the past, we've defined the boiling point as the point at which something begins to boil, and we've always said that it's temperature dependent. However, the normal boiling point is not just dependent on the temperature of the substance. It's also dependent on the atmospheric pressure. 
The normal boiling point is, de is defined as the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. In other words, if the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the liquid is greater than the vapor pressure pushing up from the liquid, the, the substance will not boil. Notice here atmospheric pressure is represented in red and vapor pressure is represented in blue. On the other hand, if the vapor pressure is equal to or greater than the atmospheric pressure, it will be able to push up on the atmospheric pressure enough to allow the substance to boil. Therefore, if we increase the temperature to the point at which the vapor pressure meets or exceeds the atmospheric pressure, we'll have achieved the boiling temperature of the substance. That brings us to the end of this video. Let's review our goals. First, we looked at how IMFs relate to phase changes. Recall that stronger intermolecular forces result in more energy required to uh, affect an endothermic phase change. Then we looked at the concept of dynamic equilibrium, when the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. Then we looked at what vapor pressure is and how it relates to normal boiling point. Recall that vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by the vapor phase of a liquid at equilibrium. Then we looked at normal boiling point, or the point at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. 